Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the nitric oxide synthase enzymes. So, so far what we've done is we've discussed the structure of these nitric oxide synthase proteins, which uh, are, come together in a homodimer to make the nitric oxide synthase enzyme. Okay, so there are three different types of nitric oxide synthase protein, and they all have this general structure where at the amino terminus, you have an oxygenase domain, and at the carboxyl terminus, you then have this reductase domain. Okay, right, uh, so we've seen there are these three different types of the nitric oxide synthase protein. Now, in order to actually make a functioning enzyme, what you need to do is you need to dimerize these nitric oxide synthase proteins together, and they only dimerize in a homodime, to, well, to form homodimers. So you can take two NOS1 proteins and dimerize them together to make a NOS1 enzyme. You can take two NOS2 proteins and dimerize them together to make a NOS2 enzyme, and you can take two NOS3 proteins together to uh, well, you can put two NOS3 proteins together to make a NOS3 enzyme. You can't mix and match. You can't form heterodimers. Okay, so now let's discuss the structure of uh, the nitric oxide synthase dimer of these two, and then we'll see how this relates to the uh, function of the enzyme. So, uh, what we will now do is we'll represent um, the... we'll continue representing uh, the nitric oxide um, synthase enzyme as these sort of uh, rectangles, okay? So this now represents the reductase domain of one of these uh, nitric oxide uh, synthase proteins, and then it's going to have this oxygenase domain, which we're now going to represent as a circle, okay? And then the amino terminus will be over here, so let's put that amino terminus to keep us oriented over here. Okay, and then over here you'll have the carboxyl terminus, of the polypeptide over there. Right, so if I colour this in, this blue portion over here is the oxygenase domain of one of these nitric oxide synthase proteins. Whereas, uh, this rectangle over here, which I'll colour in pink, the same as uh, how I denoted the reductase domain on this picture, that represents the reductase domain. Now, what you do is you dimerize this with another one of these enzymes. So here's the oxygenase domain. Oh, sorry, another one of these proteins. So here's the oxygenase domain here. And then uh, you have the reductase here. Okay, right. So it forms a dimer, like so. And this is the active enzyme now. So here is the carboxyl terminus here. And here is the amino terminus over here. So this is the amino terminus over here. Okay, so let me colour these in again. So blue is this oxygenase domain. So this is the oxygenase domain of this second, um, second um, nitric oxide synthase protein. And in pink here, here is the reductase domain. Okay, right. So, now let me add on these different binding sites for these different cofactors. So, in the oxygenase domain, there were certain uh, structures bound to the oxygenase domain that I didn't discuss at the time uh, when we discussed the oxygenase domain. So, attached to the oxygenase domain, there is a heme uh, prosthetic group. So, I'll show this like so. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you have this heme prosthetic group here, uh, which is attached to this uh, oxygenase domain, like so. And then uh, you also have a, uh, another cofactor attached in here called uh, BH4, which stands for tetrahydrobioterin. Okay, so this stands for tetro, tetra rather, hydrobioterin. Okay, bioterin. Right, so this is another cofactor uh, for uh, the function of this nitric oxide synthase enzyme. Right, and then attached to this reductase domain, we've um, seen uh, a lot of the, we've seen the examples of the cofactors which attach here. Um, here you will have uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, uh, reduced version of that binding in here. Then further down, you'll have the, f um, the flavin adenine dinucleotide, so FAD will bind here, okay? And uh, then further down still, uh, you'll have the flavin mononucleotide domain. Right, 
Okay, and remember the flavin mononucleotide binding domain was formed by these two separate uh, portions of the polypeptide which have come together now and they'll have this link in between them, this loop. Well, in the case of the calcium dependent ones, NOS1 and NOS3, they'll have this loop in between the um, two uh, halves which make up that domain. So maybe I'll just try and denote this as with some colour here. So let's have these two portions that have come together to make this flavin mononucleotide um, binding domain here. And then they'll have a loop in between like this. Okay, so there's that loop in between. Uh, so that will be green. Uh, so for the um, calcium dependent uh, nitric oxide synthase proteins, you'll have that loop. And in the case of the calcium independent one, the NOS2 protein, um, you won't have that loop. All right. Okay, and then this final linker region between the oxygenase domain and the reductase domain, I told you that that was where the calmodulin would bind. Now, this is where it differs between the three different types of NOS protein and therefore the three different types of NOS enzyme. Now, in the case of NOS1 and NOS2, you have this loop between these two halves of the flavin mononucleotide uh, binding domain here. Now, that means that calmodulin cannot bind to this linker region unless it is in the form of a calcium calmodulin complex, okay? Whereas, in the case of NOS2, um, the inducible NOS, uh, this doesn't have this linker here. It has a much smaller polypeptide um, portion linking the, um, the two halves of the flavin mononucleotide binding domain. And that results in, um, in apocalmodulin, i.e. calmodulin with no calcium bound to it, being able to bind there. Now, the enzyme cannot function unless calmodulin is bound, okay? Uh, so, it, but the enzyme doesn't care whether it's calcium calmodulin that's bound or apocalmodulin. It just needs calmodulin bound. So in the case of NOS1 and NOS3, you have to get calcium calmodulin complexes binding because apocalmodulin will not bind to cal NOS1 and NOS3 and it's because, it's thought to be because of this linker region between uh, the, flav uh, the two halves of the flavin mononucleotide binding to uh, site. Okay, this is somehow prevents uh, apocalmodulin from being able to bind here. So in order to get calmodulin binding there and turning these enzymes on, you need uh, calcium to be present within the cytoplasm of the cell. So they are calcium dependent nitric oxide synthase enzymes. Whereas in the case of NOS2 or INOS, when we talk about the INOS enzyme, we're talking about two NOS2 proteins uh, uh, dimerized together in this homodimer. And I'll just put that word up here, homodimer. Okay, so we're talking about two uh, NOS2 proteins um, in this homodimer here. And um, those, uh, those proteins can bind calmodulin when it's in the apocalmodulin state. So let me draw that in here. So here's our apocalmodulin with no calcium bound to it, basically. So that, um, that enzyme, NOS2, is calcium independent, therefore, because it doesn't need uh, calcium to be high in the cytoplasm because it doesn't need calcium calmodulin in order to bind. Apocalmodulin will do the job just fine. Okay, now, in order for the enzyme to function, you need uh, the calmodulin to be bound to um, this uh, linker region, this calmodulin binding site between the oxygenase domain in blue here. So let me just label that as the oxygenase domain and the reductase domain in pink here. So this is the reductase domain. Ooh, this is squashed. Reductase domain. Right, okay, so once uh, the um, calmodulin has bound to that calmodulin uh, binding domain, we will see that that's going to make the enzyme functional. So now what I want to do is I want to turn my attention to uh, the reaction that these nitric oxide synthase enzymes are going to catalyze and how it relates to their structure, basically. But we'll do that in the next video.